every day you would play 10, 12, 20 different type of contests uh, that involve obviously paid for uh, type of contests. There are some are, you know, very simple contests and some uh, are, are, are more sophisticated, but they all have one thing in common generally is that most of them you can win a spot that gets you in a qualifier, which can, the qualifier, which gets you a seat like it's a big thing. So there's a big transgression of obviously they have a big tournament at the end of the year, and then obviously all these qualifiers that lead up to getting to the big, uh, into the big tournament. So our discussion uh, on strategic wagering, and Dan sits in on the meetings when we have them, is, you know, how, this, we look at it as there's a huge potential opportunity uh, as a revenue generator now. Nobody in, in the private industry has probably felt that way yet because nobody's undertaken it like they have uh, on the thoroughbred industry. Uh, but I know Dan's got a lot of uh, insight into this, and, and this is an area uh, that I think can really, the thoroughbreds have really energized the fan base with these contests. Uh, they've got people are, you know, you see the, the, the show Horse Players that was on last year. I mean, all of these guys are traveling week to week to go in these contests. And these contests really, they just really energize the base and people are handicapping these races. And I think it's really a good thing. I, I don't know how we can totally take that and do it, but, but we're just talking about it conceptually. We think we've got a good uh, platform and strategic wagering that we can kind of help uh, you know, kind of get that ball rolling a little bit, but uh, uh, it's just it's just kind of right right now. It's kind of a, a, a concept, but it's certainly uh, not a concept in the thoroughbred game. It's it's something that goes on every day, and it's uh, it's, it's really got the fan base energized. And I've done a lot of research, and and I know the guys really well that run the different handicapping contest um, sites. They're friends of mine, I worked with them uh, with Thoroughbreds, I was with them when they started some of these contests. I still go to the Breeders' Cup and I see this, the guys that are playing in the contest, I've met the, a lot of the contestants. Um, the most important thing I would like, and I've asked TJ to, to take notes so I, I don't have to write things down, I really want to know what you guys think. Because when it comes to fantasy leagues and it comes to handicapping contests, which are the two things I'm going to talk about, we're talking about taking money and putting it someplace else besides where we're all used to taking money and putting it, which is in through the windows, the mutual pools. So it's really important because there's some pluses and minuses. So what I want to do today is, is kind of give you a little, a little bit of background of what I've learned some of the discussions I've had. I've met with all these guys a number of times, um, and I want to hear from you. I, I, I'm not trying to sell you or pitch you. I'm just saying this is out there, and we're not involved. And other people are involved and, and are seeing some advantages from it. So let's start with my first slide. Oh, I got the thing again. <laughs> um, um, okay, so we talked about feedback. And the other thing about both of the, the next couple things we're going to talk about, social media is really important. Um, and when you look at one of these sites, uh, Derby Wars, they've got about 35,000 people on Facebook. So uh, there's a lot of interaction there. There's the three main sites are uh, Horse Attorneys, Derby Wars, and DRF. Uh, I met with John Hardick, who's a publisher, and he is very, very interested in trying to to take over that market. He thinks handicapping contests is a way to make a lot of money. They, they do the DRF and TRA national championship uh, that, that they do in Vegas every year. Uh, and then the two, the two contests, that's one. And the Breeders' Cup Challenge is relatively new, but extremely successful. When I show you the numbers, you're not going to believe it. Uh, by a show of hands, um, how many of you have ever been, how many of you have heard of these sites, Derby Wars, Horse Tourneys, Obviously, I've been, okay. Only keep your hand up if you've been on the site or if you've played. So that's not too bad. We have a few people, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, Horse attorneys is McKay Smith. He's one of the guys that started the DRF and TRA contest with Ken Kirkner, who's now working for the DRF. Uh, they started about uh, 15 years ago. But they're the guys we use, you know, right now, in, we're, this weekend we have a seventh and eighth contest of our free ha online handicapping to get into the World Harness Handicapping Championship at uh, the Meadowlands in, in April. 
Um, and uh, so they've been doing that. And previous to about four months ago, they only did qualifying. You couldn't, you couldn't play for cash. You paid cash and played to qualify for bigger tournaments, the DRF tournament or the, uh, the Horse Player World Series. Derby Wars was just the opposite. Derby Wars is cash. Um, the, my intel is that last year they handled $4 million. Uh, but because they, want it, they, because they want some credibility and legitimacy, uh, they do have some qualifiers for the DRF NTRA contest. And the last one, which could be interesting to us because they're the ones that built the, the National Handicapping Championship. I've had two meetings in New York uh, with the people at the DRF. And they are in the process right now of coming up with a proposal to create a contest for us that they could help administrate, which would really be a big help. Because as we all know, staff-wise, to administer something like this is pretty difficult. You don't have a lot of extra people to do it. So there's some potential there. Let's just take a look at them quickly. Horse attorneys, um, if you look right over here, that's us. Uh, if you look at the website right now and you want to play tonight, that's the tab you would hit. Okay, the, the format they have, um, they have, they call pick and pray, which means you got to pick before the first race, live, and you pick in between races, and here's how it works. Let's take a look at the, the, um, the first one is a, uh, is a, as Chris said, the satellites into bigger tournaments. That's a qualifier. Uh, the, the next tournament's gonna be worth $155. You pay 17 to try and get into a $155 contest. On this one, you pay $17 to try and win 175. And you play against 16 people. And, and typically the rake for, for McKay is 89%. The rate on Derby Woods is about 12%. They take 12% on, on top. He, he again, is a qualifier, $100,000 qualifier. You pay $135 to get in, or you pay $22 to get in. Um, uh, they're uh, W money, you get in for 37, you win 70 cents, cash, cash, cash. Uh, and that's Mark Midland, who used to be the vice president of, of marketing for Churchill Downs, and a colleague when I worked for the Indian Empire herself. <coughs> Now the two the two contests the uh, the NTRA contest uh, started 15 years ago with a prize pool of $100,000. Jason's tournament two years ago had a prize pool of $100,000. Exactly when they started, they started at racetracks and OTBs. Then they moved to online. Then they launched the tour, and you had to register for it. You had to pay $50 to play, and then there's standings. It's a league. It's like fantasy leagues. It's, it's a league all year long, and you play for money up to uh, it's $250,000 involved. And if you win the tour, and then you go to the finals, you win $2 million extra. So now they've got people going around, and, and, and Chris talked about it, and I think it's at the bottom of the slide. You have people that are traveling around the country. Um, when I was at Arlington Park, we were one of the last ones before they went to Vegas. People would fly into Arlington Park the last weekend because they're trying to get to Vegas. So people come from around the country to play. Uh, in 2015, after starting 15 years ago with 100,000, the prize pool was $2.36 million this year, and the winner won $800,000. And on top of that, they gave him an Eclipse Award, so there's like an honorary thing about it. And Chris mentioned they had a reality TV show. And raise your hands if you watch horse players. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. They created a reality show. Um, and, and, they, and they grew it, the contest grew. Now here's the, here's the grand slam, okay? Uh, they began six years ago with a prize pool of $4,500. It's just, it's just Breeders Cup. They have some qualifiers now. If you want to just go and play, it costs 10,000 to get in uh, this year. But they have live and online qualifiers during the course of the year. Last year they had 287 players that played for $730,000. These are big time players. They've recruited them over the last six years. At Santa Anita, the guys that stayed in the hotel with me, 252 players bet 3.4 million real dollars through the window at Santa Anita in two days. 3.4 million dollars. So these are the big time guys. Uh, the winning prize was 230 plus the guy kept what he won, which I think was about 70,000. Was the um, and he qualified online in a contest for 110 bucks. 
I'll quickly go through what I think the arguments for and against are, okay? We're not on a radar screen. There's no contest besides the ones we created. This would put us on the radar screen. Live, co live contests bring people to the racetrack and increases your handle. Online handicapping contests, if you're gonna sit there, you're gonna handicap a bunch of races, you have an ADW account, there's a good chance you're gonna go to your ADW account and bet real money too. Here's the bottom line, they can do it without us. They can do it without us. The, the, there's people in, in thoroughbreds that don't want to do it, they're doing it anyway. Uh, unless they stop the league when they have it. Um, there's, no other, there's no other options for harness, for contest players and harness racing except for our free contest tonight and tomorrow night. Uh, and the good thing for the sites is it pro provides them content during a day part that they don't have a lot of content. And that's nighttime because we race at night. So they like it too. They like the idea of doing week, weekday nights and then on the weekends having harness racing come after the West Coast thoroughbreds for the people that want more action. It makes sense for both sides. Now, why don't we do it? Well, we talked about it. If $4 million went to Mark Midland uh, and his players, then that's maybe $4 million that didn't go into mutual pools. Um, the racetracks have no control. Um, you really can't do anything about it anyway, but let's, let's face the fact, you have no control and, and your content is being used by a third party who's making money off it when you're not really directly. And then, it, to really make this work and to build this into something, you've gotta have contests at the racetracks and the OTBs, not just online. And that takes people and it takes money and it takes logistics and it takes setting up the tote system. Uh, and doing things like that. So it's, it's work for racetracks where they might have the staffing, they might not have the money to do it, but there are some benefits. So that's what I think's good about it. That's what's obviously bad about it. And I would like to hear, TJ, are you ready? I'd like to hear any comments you have, good, bad, indifferent, white. So you made mention there towards the end of your presentation that there was no control over it from a racetrack standpoint. So that obviously is my first concern. Um, and the second concern is with this money, as you pointed out, uh, may not be going through the parent mutual windows, so n the racetrack nor the horsemen benefit from this um, unless they are at the track. So, um, but it is our product, it is our data that they be would be using from the USTA as far as programs are concerned, and then to be able to watch the signal um, obviously, there's permissions that are in place there too. I, I'm for this. I think it's a it's a it's a great idea, um, but I do think that there needs to be some controls that are in place. And so, how could we address that? Well, we can't. That's that's the thing. They don't need our signal. The people that are playing the contest have ADW accounts, so they're watching them online. They really have no control over it any more than the NFL has control over the fantasy leagues or anything else. There's really nothing that we can do if they want to do it, unless we prosecute them uh, and, and try and stop them. Uh, and the thoroughbreds haven't done that yet. It's a, it's a real quagmire. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not a... Yeah, I'm not here with a comment on why we shouldn't do it. Um, I mean, I have been in some contests. I have some friends that play the Breeders' Cup one for 10,000. Um, but most of the contests, the people I know that are in them, you're in a contest, you've done the handicapping, and let's say it's, it's not a live cash contest. You're just in a contest. They're betting their own money. You, you spend time handicapping uh, to be in a contest, you think you have the winning bet. So while it may be a $2 win place and show bet, with not live money, they're putting the money through the windows. So I don't see, and, and I'm sure there's statistics to show, you had the comment about Peter Cup and Santa Anita, how much they put through the windows. 3.4 million, two days. Yeah, I know. And then one of my friends did that. You know, I call him crazy. He says, 10,000, I'm going for the big money. So these are people that play, and getting them in the contest is a way of having them play more. So I mean, I, I don't view that as a negative, but it's, it's something you have to look at and address when you're looking to do something like this. Thank you, Chairman. Any other questions, comments? I think it's good, and I think that it's important that we be the ones to do it. You know, 
know, we let the simulcasting get out of our hands into the ADWs. We lost control of our business. If we're going to go into something like this, which is kind of fantasy, then I would think, you know, going to DRF because they have staffing and we don't might long term be shooting ourselves in the foot. It seems like a good opportunity to tie into what Bob's going to talk about later. Maybe those two can be uh, merged or blended to where people that are interested in the online content, if they're looking to play the races, looking for contests, fantasy-like environment, maybe that's uh, an avenue that could be pursued. Any other negatives? I'm really looking for negatives, why we shouldn't pursue this. And the, the exact way we do it, we'll figure out. But does anybody else that really has strong feelings against like trying to do this and see if it, if it helps us? What's the cost? Like it's already being done. Right. Yeah, he's right. You know, they, they make their money on the players, so there's very little cost to us. Um, but if we work with them, then we can sort of control and, and direct them as to you know what races to look at. And to, to me, the strategic wager, including strategic wagers, is a no-brainer. Because if people are going to handicap, sit down and handicap those races, then there's a good chance they, they might think about saying, I can make some real money guaranteed pools. Um, so by working, can, first of all, they're not going to do it unless we encourage them. They'll, and they will do it because I know they, they told me they would if we can coordinate. And what we benefit is indirect, all those pros and cons that you have on that page. That's where, that's where we, uh, you know, that's where we gain. Uh, I just yes, have a question, which maybe you can answer, that deals with that. Why haven't these guys, the reward that they've got, into harness racing yet? What, what is, what is, what, what is stopped them? I think they're just thoroughbred guys. Honestly, and, and they have more than they can handle. McKay is overwhelmed. His business has gone up like five times since he started doing cash. They, they, they just have enough. They're doing very, Mark Midland's doing very well financially. Okay. Is there any information out there on the curve that our contest is run? Um, I know they're reaching out to the existing fan base. Are they cultivating any new fans? I haven't asked them that. I can, and I will. I know that when we did our, our, our contests for the first time with McKay, that his database increased by 15% from our players coming over to his site. 15% new people that he never saw before. So I know you get that crossover. A, a brand new fan? I don't think so. I think maybe the next thing we talk about fantasy leagues is, is maybe a better, uh, a better way to push people into that. Speaking of fantasy leagues, uh, uh, one second. Um, isn't there a, a currently a, a fantasy league that's out there um, run by somebody around the Monticello area? I remember, I remember seeing something. Do you know anything about that and how that's going? You know as much as I do. <laughs> you want to talk about it, Mike? Briefly, I don't know a whole lot. But <laughs> now, Ryan lost, uh, launched a website, I think it's fantasytrap.com, uh, towards the beginning of the year. Um, to the best of my knowledge, been on it a few times. He's still kind of in the beta testing phase. It's rather rudimentary. Uh, it involves picking drivers rather than horses. Um, and I have not talked to Ryan since, I guess, early January, uh, maybe late December, I forget, somewhere around the holidays. Um, but he had hopes that he could gain some traction. Um, as compared to the larger fantasy sites at, say, uh, DraftKings and, and, uh, and FanDuel, um, it's, it's, as I said, rather rudimentary as compared to um, a lot of the bells and whistles that the other sites have, but it is, to my knowledge, the only harness racing entry at this point. He's done it entirely on his own. I don't know what his business plan is, uh, but go over and check it out maybe tonight and, uh, and, and give us your feedback on that. It's fantasytrunk.com. See, that was originally what I was talking about is, you know, something along those lines. But as Dan answered, and, and I'm neither here nor there with this, 
Um, I, as a matter of fact, I think it's a, it's these two, the, the fantasy harness racing league that, that Ryan has and these types of wagers, I don't want to call them wagers, but contests um, are, are good. They're arms of marketing for the sport, but my concern is the how you know how it's portrayed and, and those types of things to the public and is it something that the USTA can get involved with and as Nick had did, Mr. Salvi had pointed out earlier that is it something rather than farming this out to the daily racing form is this something that we want to take on at the USTA with these handicapping contests creating a fantasy league those types of things because these are the this is the next step as we're seeing, and some of these people, as we're seeing now too, are stepping out and moving around the USTA and around the racetracks and around the horsemen's organizations, and that's a cause for concern for me. That's what I was getting at earlier. Just individual tracks, but as I said, you know they're already doing it. And they don't need they, they don't need anything from the racetrack. I understand. So if a third party does it, they don't care. If we do it, theoretically, we are taking possibly taking some money away from a racetrack who believes that's what's happening and therefore we have to recognize it. I can see what and, you're saying. And, horse, and horsemen. I can horsemen see what you're saying and that's my initial concern with this. But my, my bigger <coughs> concern is is how these places like the, the fantasy, fantasy harness racing and these handicapping contests are being portrayed and done with the public. And again, it sidesteps the racetrack and it sidesteps the USTA and it sidesteps the horsemen's organizations. And I, I it, it, to me, um, I get concerned about it. That's why I think if we can do something as the USTA with both of those being fantasy and these handicapping contests, rather than letting other people do it, I think that this is an opportunity for revenue share amongst all of us um, in the future. Uh, but it is gonna take some undertaking. With Saratoga Harness and Bob starting up, I think next week. Yep. Uh, um, ours has been kind of a last man standing type of uh, contest, and it's actually been received quite well. We do it every two weeks. Uh, you know, we have a small website, but we've been getting about 127 participants from us. Saratoga does about twice that many. Um, the concern I have if we're doing something through someone like the Daily Racing. A lot of us have internet platforms. I'm assuming the handicap contest would drive the customer to the daily racing forum platform. Am I correct? That, uh, that's what I was they would want. Yeah, they want to be Walmart. They and want to if, be if, if Mr. Axelrod is correct, these people are also going to wager. They would likely be wagering on that website, wouldn't they not? Yeah, that, that's what DR, they, DRF wants to get them there, to give them some information. And therefore, that would take them away from other websites such as the one that we have in one pocket. A lot of us have our own wagering websites. Right. Correct. I understand. No, I, that, that's, 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 this is the type of healthy healthy discussion and debate be, that we need to have because I think these are some of the things that going forward that we need to look at um, to, to be able to grow um, our business from a horse players and, and, and fan creation standpoint. President Langley. I think that it's a good idea if we can do it. <laughs> Um, I, I know the fools could think, but it gets a little bit touchy. Like in Illinois, I'm pretty sure that our handicapping contest, which we've had a real good response to, but we can't charge an entry fee. And I'm not sure what it is in other states, but if you can't charge an entry fee, I don't know how you get it built up like you want. So you almost have to go through a separate entity like the racing form. That's something we ought to look into now and see what the state laws are as far as having to pay to get into a handicap contest. I know in New York we're we're not, we're not able to, to charge anything um, for those contests. New Jersey is different, um, but the separation of there in New York, you can't charge anything to anybody entering those contests. It has to be available to everybody. That's my understanding, correct, Mr. King? Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, I think you can charge, you just have to give all the money that you collect That's back to the prizes. I'm with Mike in terms of uh, I don't really want to push internet um, customers to the Daily Racing Forum's website. If we could push them to one of our websites, or you know, or the USDA, and then the USA can push them around. But I, you know, I, I think it's a problem if you 
if you set it up through a provider that has an internet um, way to go about it. Yeah. Any other questions? I like them, but I like them and I think it's something to do. Well, I like them, yeah, for sure. Uh, I think it's a great idea too. I think it's a, these are two great arms of marketing with with fantasy and, and these types of contests, but how do we do it and have some control over it so that both the racetracks and the horsemen are able to benefit from it as well. Um, you know, there's, there's a track record. And I think their major concern is pushing this to, to an ADW when, when the possibility exists that we could either do it in-house at the USTA um, or through another, another organization that possibly one, would want to take it on, but within the harness racing community. Because isn't racing one, two, three similar to this as well? I'm not as familiar with them. I've, we, I've only dealt with them for specific contests for like one kind of promotion. I, I haven't, I don't, they don't really kind of run things on a daily basis like these other guys do. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Mr. Brown. Well, I, I guess let's assume that, that we could start it up, that we could create our own and go on. Don't we also, I would assume, if, if I understood Dan correctly, if it's successful, Let's say we had a home run. It's going to get copied by these guys anyway. I mean, they're going to jump in and create their own contest to compete with the one that we create because I, because the, the content is there for them to take. From the racetrack point of view, you're talking about? I think no, I'm talking about these independent people, DRF, whatever, and the other uh, ones you mentioned because they'll still have access to the same content that we do. So if, if we prove you can make money at her, if we prove it's successful by whatever the only definition that is. The only information that the sites actually need are results and prices. Everything else comes, people, contest players get on their own. They just need to be able to calculate the winners. They don't need anything else. But I think, that, again, and there's good points that are being made here, and but none so more important that you know, as like simulcasting, as Mr. Salvi pointed out, that's something that got away from us. Um, we all know that that model is broken. I don't think there's anybody in this room that, that would argue that. Um, and obviously this is something we don't want to get away from us, but I can see this very quickly getting away from us in the near future. Another show of hands. How many people have heard of FanDuel or DraftKings? Um, I heard a commercial for DraftKings on the way over here. Um, FanDuel is uh, Hertz, number one, and they have been for a while, and DraftKings is number two, and they're trying a lot harder. Um, it's a $1.7 billion industry, and most of that growth has been in like the last two years. Um, we haven't talked to either one of them, um, but once again, I want to hear what you think. Um, quickly, FanDuel has, uh, gives, gives away uh, uh, 10 million cash every week. They have more than 20,000 uh, leagues every day. They do the four major professional sports, college football and, and uh, basketball. Uh, they have free and paid contests, free contests to hook you. Um, back in the 70s in New York, they called it Hello Theory. You give it away because they were hooked and they didn't make them pay for it. This guy is like Flo from Progressive. He's on there every single day. He's up to several hundred forty-four thousand dollars that he's made playing. And they have uh, 450,000 uh, Facebook, <coughs> Facebook followers. Uh, DraftKings, uh, they're right now they're saying they're gonna give away a billion dollars this year. Uh, they do the four professional sports leagues, college football, basketball. They also do PGA, MMA, and soccer. Uh, they have daily and weekly games. Last year at the Breeders' Cup, the CEO's there. They sponsored one of the Breeders' Cup races at Santa Anita. Uh, they did the Winner's Circle presentation, and in addition to that, and I say NBC Sports here, but it was Sports Network. Uh, they did an interview on the NBC Sports Network and announced that before this year's Kentucky Derby, the list is gonna include horse racing. They're, gonna, they're developing a horse racing game, specifically. Um, <clears throat> and it's supposed to roll it out soon. They do the same thing, free and paid contests. They're all over the place. They're on sports talk. They're on sports talk radio advertising. They advertise during the World Series poker. Um, they're spending a lot of money to, to, to get people. Um, 
I just wanted to throw it out there. It's out there too, we're not involved, we're not talking to anybody. Anybody want to tell me, I, I, I talked to Rob, I think Rob can, can, can help us reach out to the people. I can find out from the NTRA people who the people will talk to at DraftKings, they may be interested. Comments, welcome. Some of you may be asking, but this is a way, this is the way that they got around the government uh, with sports betting is a game of chance versus a game of skill. So that's, for those of you, that, that that's how they got around it at this point. Where are they located? I don't even know. I honestly don't know. Boston. And that, there is one in Boston. I know, I think that's uh, FanDuel that's in Boston, yes. Boston. Sorry, it's still my Ohio accent. <laughs> Any other comments or question? What'd you say? <laughs> it's like dog and jog. But those are the members of the committee. Uh, those are the people in our industry that um, have had a lot of dealings with television, represent the races that have been on television recently. 
um, and it's a really good group. We've also gotten some help from Tom Charters uh, when Moira couldn't be available and Phil Terry, who are two hugely valuable people who have been involved with to, uh, harness racing on television, uh, a broad base of experience. So we, we've got uh, a good group and we've got an awful lot of stuff. Uh, the reason we were formed to originally was to explore the funding of getting our uh, sport on national television. Uh, <clears throat> we found out an amazing amount of stuff. If you sit and read the attachments that are in front of you on the airplane going home, you'll be amazed at what's going on. And all those things are from the last three or four months. Um, I'd like to thank Rob Key, who has been a huge source of education to me on a lot of this stuff because he deals with major corporate clients who are on the cutting edge of a lot of this stuff. And the stuff that I'm sharing with you is basically sports, but it's happening all over the world and in a lot of different places. We all know the history. Last year, uh, we wanted to get three races on TV. We had a fund. Uh, we got some races on TV, but that's not going to work for the future. It worked once, but it can't be sustained. <coughs> So we had a conference call. Um, we looked at uh, some extensive information and a lot of stuff that's alternate to just national or national cable television. Uh, we're looking at long range planning because we don't have the revenue to pay to be on television all the time. So what we'd like to do is uh, look at multiple platforms, figure out how we can fund this thing and possibly even make some money so that we can turn it back into promoting our sport. <coughs> We realized there's a whole lot of stuff besides TV. So we voted to call it, to change our names to the USTA Broadcast Committee. It makes a lot more sense. Um, the first thing we talked about, Chris Schick said, you know what, you have $50,000 in the budget um, for helping racetracks get their races on TV. Let's make it $150,000. So it's, it's going to be presented here at these meetings. Uh, last night we had uh, dinner and we, we we're formulating a mission statement so everybody, know, everybody knows very clearly. And then most importantly for those of you that are going to try and get on TV, and I know Stacy, we got a, a nice uh, little proposal from Jason. Um, we need to define to you what we need from the USDA to say, okay, you can, you, here's funding that, that, that's here for you. Um, but. Don't misunderstand, the USTA is not like the Jockey Club. We're not going to go to NBC Sports Network and, and negotiate this stuff. We're just not in a position to do that. So it's sort of the individual effort, and we're going to try the best we can to support you to help you do that. And then if you do get on TV, you can use me as much as you want. I know a lot about it. <coughs> So the first thing I did, I said, okay, well, what is it actually costing us to be on TV? All right, so I'm going to run through the numbers really quickly. We have no ratings from CBS Sports Network. We have no demographics. So I'm going to guess. I'm going to say that 100,000 people watch the Little Round Jug and Maryland's Pace. I think that's generous. We have some numbers for the last couple of years for the Hambo, 175,000. So let's say that generously we had 375,000 people. It cost us 467,000 people. That means it cost us $1,250 to reach 1,000 people. That's the cost CPM, cost per. That's how advertisers debate. So I looked around, I said, okay, let's look at some other things. $1,250 for 1,000 for us. Our social media effort for $250,000 would reach 16 million. Now you can say, well, that's apples and oranges, but that's the number. It costs $16 per thousand. Just the video that we did on social media would reach almost I think it was 945,000. The cost per thousand was 264. 32nd spot on the Super Bowl, $4.5 million. 114 million viewers. It costs $393 to reach 1,000 people. That's a quarter of what it cost us to be on CBS Sports Network, to be on the Super Bowl. And primetime TV on any of the networks, Monday to Sunday night, costs. Twenty-four seventy-six, twenty-five dollars to reach a thousand people. So what we're not doing is we're not cost-effectively reaching people by being on national TV. But people have a lot of other reasons to want to be on national TV. But I think it's important to look at this. So what we said was, let's look at some other things: live streaming subscriptions. There's one in horse racing that already exists. It's the AQHA. Uh, it's called Q Racing Live. 
a subscription live streaming, streaming every AQHA race there is and a video archive. <coughs> um, all of the technical support, it comes from Roberts. So none of the racetracks that have AQHA racing, quarter horse racing, have to do anything. Everything goes through Roberts, so it's, it's very cost effective. <coughs> um, they, when they first started, it was free. Um, and they did it as a service to their membership, and then they realized, well, this is a little expensive, $8,000 a month, and, and maybe we can make some money. So uh, after a few months, they, they offered it um, for eight ninety five dollars monthly fee. And uh, they have to pay Roberts $8,000 a month. Well, we've had extensive conversations with Roberts, and they're willing to do the same thing for us. Drew Schubeck was my boss at Lone Star Park. We have a really good relationship, and he's very flexible to talk to us about anything we might do. So how are they doing with it now that they're paying for it? They have 2,400 subscribers, okay, at 8.95. They need 890 to break even on the 8,000, because they get the first 8,000. And then after that, it's a 50-50 revenue split. So right now, they're making almost $7,000 a month on subscription TV. Multiply that by 12, you have $100,000. Um, and, and quarter horse season hasn't started yet. <coughs> he, I talked to him yesterday, he said once quarter horse season starts, we're gonna get more subscribers. So it already exists in, in horse racing. They wanna do it for us. They're going HD in April for tracks out of the HD signal. It's something that we should really look at. And then people can't say, I can't watch the races because every race will be available. But then we looked at the outside world and there's a really, really good model. Uh, it's the WWE Network. They took a really big chance. Um, they went to a, a, um, a monthly subscription, $10 a month. You can cancel any time. You get a thing in your email saying, you're gonna get billed. Do you want us to bill you this month? If you don't tell them not to, uh, if you tell them not to, they will. Every pay-per-view event, they have one a month. They have a comprehensive library of historical stuff. Just like all the stuff that we're trying to pawn off on Janet up in the Hall of Fame, we got all this historical stuff that we could use too. 24-7 uh, video on demand because they've got this library and archive and live programming. And then they build some live programming on top of it with original series reality shows and documentaries. <coughs> Where can you watch it? Apple TV, Amazon TV, Roku, Sony PlayStation, Xbox, Smart TV, Android, iPhone. You can watch it on your app, you can watch it on your desktop, you can watch it on your laptop. Where can't you watch it? You can't watch it on cable. They thought they were crazy. Their stock, their stock dropped. Um, but you know what? In 11 months, they got a million subscribers. 90% of the subscribers go and they look at it at least once a week and 99% of the subscribers look at it once per month and the people are watching their pay-per-views at <coughs> $9.99 a month instead of $40 or $50 for pay-per-view. And they did something really smart and a little expensive because we explored it. Rob had a conversation with the Major League Baseball TV. That's the platform. Best platform there is out there. That's what NCAA March Madness is gonna be. They built an enormous platform and, and that's where wrestling is. They eliminated the expense of cable production and they doubled their revenues in less than a year. It's the same exact formula as the Q racing. It's a different world. It's not even a real sport. <coughs> so we said, is Heather Vitale here? Let's don't tell our kids. Um, so we said, okay, so, so what if Mike and I are sitting in his office one day and said, so what if we go to the meeting and say to these guys, yeah, let's just do it. Come on, we'll just put $8,000 in the budget. What happens if we don't get enough people? So we, we did a little marketing research. For one week, we put a poll up on the USTA website for our homepage, and we supported it because Rob's going to talk about some marketing research he did. This is the question. Would you be willing to pay $10 a month for a streaming video service accessible on your computer, tablet, phone, or mobile device to view any harness racing live in the United States with access to a complete uh, library replays? Well, we got 2,600 responses and two-thirds of them said yes. 1,749 people. We only need 890 to break even. That, that doesn't mean they're gonna buy it, but we didn't promote it, we didn't advertise it, we didn't direct market. We put a poll on Facebook and our website, and we have twice as many people as we need to break even. I think we got a shot. 
<coughs> so let's say we call it the Harness Channel. What do we get? We get live streaming, we get archives and races, we get the, this is really key, and this is what we need to talk to Rob about. Can we add live programming? Can we take three hours on a Friday and a Saturday and do like a little live programming? It would be really important, WWE spelled it. We've got historical video that we can load up. Uh, limited reasonable production and time costs. We're not buying time on network TV. And there's the ability to create our own program. We can take content from the racetracks. We can take the Metal Ass Replay Show. We can put the Stan Bernstein show on. Like I used to watch the Home Run Derby, Mickey Mantle, and that's the Al Kaline on, on ESPN. We could do the same thing. We can promote the Hamiltonian with old Hamiltonian footage. The, you know, the week before the Hamiltonian, the tracks can supply us with <coughs> content. And as I said, soon to be in HD in April. Um, <coughs> what's good about it? We own it. We're not paying somebody else. I'm going to do this quickly because Rob's going to talk about this too. Um, we can make some money to subscription, advertising, sponsorship. You can look at it any place, any time, on any device. Uh, you can deliver on demand 24-7 and you can grow distribution globally. You don't need a cable, you don't need a wire, you don't need a, you know, a microwave. It's on the internet. And we just came back from the World Traveling Conference and there's a lot of interest in, in that kind of stuff. Um, the other thing that's really cool is what do we know about, how many people watched the Hamiltonian last year on CBS Sports Network? <clears throat> wow, it's not too many for this group. What do we know about all the people that watch that? What do we know about anyone that watched it? Well, we don't know anything. But if we do it this way, we have contact information for everybody that views it. And so we can use that to research, market research by contacting them. We can use CRM to learn more about what they like. We can get some direct feedback from them and we can market directly to them. And we can help sell our sport. <coughs> Um, I'm going to skip this stuff because Rob's going to cover it, but I think the biggest customers recently surpassed the number of cable subscribers in the U.S. There are more people that can watch TV not on TV than on TV, uh, and, and that's not going to change. Networks are creating live streaming. They're all doing it. They're all going to have pay services. Um, there's new broadcast platforms, Amazon Fire, Chromecast, Apple TV. You don't need to, I, I got so mad this week. I went to every game of the Big East tournament for eight years in a row in Madison Square Garden, and UVerse won't show, uh, Fox Sports 1 won't show the Big East. I'm ready to, to go this way. I had enough. Um, in your packets, uh, the, if you wanted to say attachments, the first part of it are some feature stories. There's some really good information in there. And then I, I get a, a sports marketing newsletter that'll blow you away with, with what some of the other networks and what some of the sports entities are doing. I got a whole bunch of headlines I was going to fire through to show you with baseball and NBC. And, and most of those clips come from the last three or four months. Like I said, we're running behind. I'm not going to do it. The stuff has to be fixed. Uh, I'll, I'll just do that. I'll just get out of here. But there's uh, stuff about March Madness. Um, there's, uh, there's an app for cricket, there's an app for the, for the Rugby World Cup. What's the last, anybody seen a cricket game recently? Ping pong. <laughs> <laughs> President Langley has. I've watched on Australia, I have no idea what the hell The stuff, the stuff that we've learned, and Ivan said last night, God, you sent me that story on surfing, I was like, oh my God. Five million people are watching surfing. The stuff that you will read in there, I, I think that I know that I was, uh, I have no clue all this stuff was going on all at once. So now you're looking at it, all these, all these networks and, and entities are live streaming. The question is, why would they do that? Why would they compete against themselves with all this live streaming when they want people to go and, and, and watch TV so they can sell the advertising? Well, it's really easy because they'll deliver a far greater audience. People are still gonna watch the Super Bowl on TV, they're still gonna watch the Kentucky Derby and the Hamiltonian on TV, but they can watch it somewhere else too. They can increase the ad revenue, ad revenue and sponsorship value because now people can watch it in all those places. It, it goes globally, you know, if you don't have Time Warner or, or Uverse, you can't very well watch it in France. 
Um, so the streamers, we talked about this again. This is a term Rob uh, taught me anyway, anytime, any device. And it reaches across all demographics because we had a talk last night and Tom Charter says we should put the Hamiltonian on TV just because we are racing fans have been watching it for years and that's what they want us to do. Well, that's what we can do. We can deliver the content both to the tra traditional watch TV and to the ever-growing audience that doesn't. I think I got one more and then I'm done. <coughs> We want to compete um, with revenues on traditional TV. We don't have the money. Uh, we don't have the advertisers, we don't have the sponsors. We don't have anyone to pay us. We don't have big title sponsors just for races anymore. Uh, but we can utilize live streaming and technology. We can promote harness racing and increase our audiences. We can attract advertisers, advertisers and sponsors to our sport. Um, I said to Tom Charles, it's like the iceberg. The tip of the iceberg is like the Hamiltonian, and maybe the Meadowlands Pace, or the International Trot, or the Breeders' Cup, and that's what's on TV, and the rest is all underwater. But it's all there for us to do. There's one thing I would ask you to read in here, in this package. It's the first story. Uh, it's a USA Today story about Gary Bettman, because all this stuff that we're talking about, the, uh, social media is cr crucial and intertwined. They determined that traditional media was underserving the NHL, as they are underserving harness racing. So they had problems reaching and engaging their new fans. So what did they do? They said instead of really pushing what, what people say we should do because we're the big four, they decided to use social media, and they went crazy. Mike and I went to the All-Star game this year. We had four executives from the NHL sitting two rows in front of us on iPads and iPhones. They weren't even watching the game. <coughs> so. Batman led the charge, 3.7 million Facebook, 3 million Twitter, 750,000 Instagram, and in one year, their results were they outsold, in major markets, they outsold the NBA, they had more sellouts than an NBA, and they had record revenues, they're selling more hockey stuff. Um, what else happened? Well, television was one of those underperforming assets for them. Well, TV viewership set records and went up 12%. They drove people to TV through social media. They didn't use TV to, to, to promote the game. They used social media to promote their TV, which now is a more effective tool that they can use to promote their game. <coughs> they got a 10-year, $2 billion contract with NBC Sports. And it's not just because they deliver 532,000 people per per NHL telecast, because that's what it is. It's only, half, <coughs> it's only half a million people. It's because they go across all these digital platforms. Uh, and that, that's what makes it better. When I was at work at the NHL, we got 50 million from ESPN. Now we're getting uh, 200 million. The last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce Rob, unless um, Jason has more to say, or you have comments or questions about any of the broadcast stuff. Does anybody have any questions or comments about it? <coughs> yes, Ms. Bell. Live streaming. Okay, so live streaming could go in. I understand live streaming can be put on television. The fact this exists, there's, the, there's you know, the, Roberts has got a $50 package you can do on Dish. They've got a $25 package you can do all thoroughbred racing on the internet. They've got a $9 package you can do all AQHA racing, uh, quarter horse racing. This stuff is there. It's already there. We're not, we're not, we're not creating the wheel. It's stuff that's already there. The question is, do we want to go that route, and do we want to utilize that? And then do we want to build on it like the WWE did? So you're taking, you're taking. I mean, obviously you can use your phone, but the phones can be plugged through HDMI cords and things like that into your televisions, and what's streaming on your phone can then be streamed on your, your television. So it's not like you're sitting around staring at your phone or your iPad, but um, that stuff can be put onto your television through the cord. So what's the question? What's the difference between this and what's going on with the 
Do you want to answer this? Uh, yeah, I'd love to answer this. You know, when we first started talking about it, the first, the, what's the difference between the, doing this and just being on Twin Spies or any other ADW? This is not meant for ADW players. This is meant for others. Um, but there would be some advantage. Others being who? People that don't have ADW accounts are others than people that have ADW accounts. There's a few things, though, that would make this an advantage even if you had an ADW account because the quality the quality will probably be better as we move forward. Um, they are now working on um, they're now working on the ability to go through Roku. There's the ability to add original programming. The one thing we can't do with this is we can't break into the simulcast signal and say, you know, have have Allison and TJ and okay, we're sitting, you know, in the winter circle talking to Jason uh, before the Hamilton. We can't do that. That that stream has to stay by itself. But we can build programming around it, sort of like. Sort of like when they do live look-ins in the NCAA but March Madness. They're in the studio, oh, we're going to go to Kentucky now, and then we're going to go to Baylor, and then we're gonna, we can do that kind of stuff that ADWs can't. And this is the, this is the type <coughs> of stepping stone, too, with, uh, that I can see in, in coordinating with, with, you know, they go on television, but also in coordinating post times uh, with racetracks and being able to show this race here, uh, you know, sort of, I'll say, like a TVG maybe. Uh, but over mm -hmm. live stream over the internet. So it would be some coordination that could go on between the racetracks as well. And if those that are not um, co coordinating, then they would be shown on tape delay uh, during a, a time where they're, uh, when it was available. Yes, Mr. Mulley. <coughs> There's one fundamental to this thing that we have. In order for a racetrack enforcement to make money, it has to be wagering. And if there's not a wagering component with this, what is the benefit of the race track? To grow the business. Viewership. More people are going to watch it, it's fine. But then they decide they want to wager, and then they go to Twin Spires, and we end up paying a fee to Twin Spires. There has to be a wagering component that we control if it's going to be successful for the race track to work. Except for. Tom. Ex except for people, why does this keep doing? Except for people who are involved in racing or, or fans of racing, how many people do you know that flip around the channels and never watch horse racing and sit there and watch it when it's not the Kentucky Derby or the Hamiltonian if they're not betting on it? Not too many. <coughs> test, test. I think Dennis, you laid up, you laid against that maybe. Press the button on the left. The oh, there's, there's shopping light. My point is that Don't get the my, my point is that people there's not a lot of people that watch horse racing for very long unless they have some connection to it. They either are in the business or they're betting on it or they look at it and go, oh, that's kind of cool, and then they can become a fan, and then they might come to your track and make a bet. So the idea is to expose people to it. And through, through some of the things we can do with live streaming and content generation and stuff, we can show people what's good about it. We can show people what's good about it. Um, and so, you know, we want the, the, the first step is create awareness. And so that's what, where we start to go, is what, where we've been with social media. And, you know, through incentivizing them to come to the racetrack, hopefully then, you know, one day they would come and say, I like racing, and then they would learn how to handicap, and they'd become a wager. And I think part of, and, 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 but part of the, what, you know, are we a niche sport or are we going to mass market this sport? I think those are some of the important questions uh, that this industry, this sport is going to have to answer over the next few years. Um, you know, that's kind of my take on it, but go ahead, Mr. The only question is, what is the incentive for somebody who is not a racing aficionado to go to my live video streaming all of a sudden and start watching the horse races. I won't go watch cricket. I won't go watch surfing if I don't have any interest in it. I don't have any interest in it. And there's certainly no wagering element that I can, you know, put the, you know, a gambling element to it, which is what drives people to fantasy football and everything else. Where's the incentive for that person who doesn't know racing to all of a sudden decide, hey, I'm going to go watch it and start social media? Yeah, that's a good question. That's that's the age-old marketing question. How do you get them interested in your product or service to buy it? Um, one of the one of the ways, and I think I'm most effective right now, or through 
uh, you know, people make decisions based upon what their friends advise them to do. They buy stuff, they, they, they make entertainment choices, uh, and a lot of those decisions are being made through social media right now. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the question, how do, you know, how do we sell it? When you get the answer, let me know. <laughs> Any other questions or comments before we move on to uh, Rob's presentation? Isn't there a move at federal level to bring all of this stuff under the control of the FCC? And if so, is somebody staying ahead of what that's likely to mean uh, as you foster a new platform and I think Rob's going to address some of this in your presentation. Yeah, I, can, I, can, I mean, I can talk to that. Okay. I mean, you're probably talking about net, net neutrality, maybe. Yeah. 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 I mean, you might be talking about net neutrality, which is, you know, whether the cable companies are trying to throttle back certain traffic from other sites. This is perfect. Becoming the media. And look, there's a common theme in all this, right, that I've heard. It's about starting to control our own destiny and starting to control our own destination and starting to monetize assets that we've handed over to third parties, including ADWs and, and cable networks. You mentioned, yeah, it's great to send it to, uh, you know, to, um, to uh, either the cable stations or, or to, uh, to um, yeah, thank you. I, I and we don't want to lose control of that yeah, relationship I wasn't, I wasn't with consumers. Really sure we need to build that relationship back with consumers and we need to control our future. And, what I think is going to differentiate, I think this from an ADW account, frankly, is we're trying to build a new, uh, you know, new fans, new potential fans who might tune in a little bit, for example. But we have to start to create additional programming uh, around the sport too. So, you know, having some journalists talking about what's happening for the night, and we're doing some things around that. It's just called an over-the-top strategy. This is about us starting to go direct and own our destiny and monetize it instead of sending it to third parties who make the money and then they give us a little, a few pennies on the dollar, right? Um, so this is, there's a much bigger theme here. I think I'll talk a little bit more about it when we get to this. I think that's a very good answer. Thanks, Rob. I appreciate it. Yes, Mr. We go to USDA channel, whatever it's called, right? We go up there and look, there'd be a window that says raising from Yonkers. Click on that. And then there would be a separate program Another window? Yeah, you know, I've only looked at um, Q Racing a couple times. Drew uh, shared his password with me, and I didn't want to abuse the privilege. But yeah, there's different, and, and actually the, the graphics are really nice. You go from track to track, um, they have entries, they have results information, and yeah, you do, you jump from track to track. There's a, there's a, menu, there's a menu of which tracks are live. And then even the ones, you know, before they start racing, they've got the entries. You can go track to track. Okay, so I come on, I watch John Chris race like the fourth race is over for John Chris. What do I do then? You click back or you click on the menu and then uh, they put the screen. Well, there can be a program that you alluded to. Is there going to be Jason there talking about Friday night? Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. John Chris is the seventh race. It's their simulcast feed. That's what it is. It's, it, it's just their simulcast feed. That's exactly what it is. No, it's the OTV channel in New York. What, what's going to keep me at the channel if I'm not a, if I'm not a, if I'm a new person? What's going to keep me at the channel? Nothing. All right. I, I don't know how to answer that. I don't know what's going to get you on the channel if you're not interested in it. Why would you be there? Well, I think that answer, that's what he's saying, and, and, and Mr. Moe is saying, too, is that how do, you know, what is the, this additional step? And I think Rob's going to address this in his presentation. You know, why is this additional step necessary? Um, and it's, it, those, are, those are good questions. Yeah, let me, let me. Especially because one thing that I can see this turning into, again, and morphing into is, that there's a broadcast of a live feed of you know Mike Tanner and, and, and Dan Leary sitting there hosting harness racing from no, across North America on this website too. Let me, yeah, let me let me just say one thing. He said I'm a little defensive, but I, now I understand what you're saying. It, it's it's a component of, of a bigger picture. That's both of you. That's my answer. Yeah, the only other point that I would make, we're, we're talking about a wish list down the road as to what we would like and what we wouldn't like. At its very basic right now, we have 1,700 people on a poll that said they would pay $10 a month for an amalgamation of live streams, that would be enough to, to get us off the ground to pay for itself. Um, it would be one-stop shopping. It would largely be appealing to people who don't have ADW accounts because they can already get that as it is. And that was some of the comments we got from people who said, no, I don't need this. I'm getting this now. 
But there are a lot of people out there, two for everyone that said no, that indicated that, that they wouldn't buy it. Once we realized that, that's when we started talking about leveraging the assets that we already have and the content that we're able to generate, the content that the racetracks are already providing. That's down the road, hopefully not too far down the road if we get this underway. But at the very least, I think this is something that could pay for itself and would, again, at least seek to organize what is largely, and I think we would all agree about this, a fragmented sport. Right. Absolutely. So I think the last comment that I'll make um, is that we didn't get here where we are overnight. We're certainly not going to get everything fixed overnight either. This is going to, this, you know, this is a whole plan um, that includes social media and these key components that are inside of those social media plans. Um, so does anybody else have any questions or comments before we turn it over? Yes, President Lyman. Just one comment, kind of answering Frank's question. Um, I don't have an idea how you're coming anywhere. And I do like to watch the races. It's, if I'm in my office, I'm more or less fine because I can switch channels. But if I'm not there and I want to watch the races, this would be a good thing. And you said you could open up an AEW account for 10 bucks. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 So the 1,700 people, how many of those have AMW accounts? We don't know. Okay. So, so the people that said no, frankly, a lot of them said, I don't need this because I have an AMW account. I think I said 